So today I'm going to be telling you about a fascinating phenomenon um, and introduce you to also one of the most complex organs in your body. This is the brain. It's a fist-sized chunk of neural tissue and it has miraculous computational power. Uh, why? Because it has 86 billion neurons or neural cells, each of which is a computational powerhouse in itself. So the brain can do marvelous things and everything we've achieved today uh, as humanity, we owe to this organ, right? Including organizing this event, everything we owe to this organ. It's uh, uh, one of the, the most uh, sort of powerful organs in the body. It receives input about the world from many, many different senses. It receives input about your eyes, your uh, hearing, your taste, touch, all over the body. Everything comes into the brain. There are millions of neurons that represent every one of these senses. There are also millions of neurons that give you exquisite control of actions. So moving your hand, moving your jaw, moving your eyes, everything is under the control of millions of neurons in the brain. So now that I've played up the brain a lot, now I'm going to ask you to do a very simple task. You have to do it in your mind. Imagine that you're hearing everything I'm saying and writing down, right? Transcribing everything, every word accurately. While at the same time, you're also seeing what's on the screen and naming every word, every object that's there on the screen, right? So like you have the book, the pen, the mobile phone, the cup and so on. You have to do both of these things at the same time. Now, most of us would really struggle to do this because there's, you know, not just one thing, but you have to do two things at a time. Now, as a neuroscientist, this is a particular puzzle for me because the different parts of the brain that, uh, you know, process auditory information, sounds, also visual information, right? Also the parts of the brain that allow you to move your hand and the parts of the brain that allow you to move your jaws, right, and your vocal apparatus those are all in very, very different parts of the brain. They're all like millions of neurons devoted to each of them. There's no reason for them to interfere with each other. And yet, if I asked you to do this, both of these things at the same time, most of us would struggle, right? Why is that? Why is this straight of attention, right? So as many of you may know, straits are a very narrow passage of water between two land masses. So they prevent the free flow of ships and traffic uh, through them. So the straits of attention are really what prevent you from taking advantage of the abundance of sensory information that your senses gather and translating them into meaningful action. They limit you, they constrain you in some way. You have to focus on one thing to the exclusion of other things, right? And the straits of attention are also the reason magicians can uh, sort of pull the wool over your eyes, right? So they distract you, they do so many things, they overload your attention so that you know, they're going to do very mundane card tricks and you're going to be, you know, totally sort of fascinated and puzzled as to what happened, right? It's all your attention. They're playing with your attention. Um, and also, it's attention that prevents you from doing these two very critical things at the same time. You can't text and drive, right? So that's known to be, a, it's, it's illegal in many places. And in fact, uh, I was surprised to see this sign showing up in the uh, marine drive yesterday when we were going along it. So attention has, you know, very, uh, uh, you know, critical consequences, this idea of the straits of attention. Now, if uh, I have not convinced you about this, I'm going to do a small demonstration. What I'm about to show you is a movie with two images, right? Image A, image B, image A, image B. You're going to see a sequence of two images. They look very, very similar, but there's a major difference between them. And if you notice what the difference is, I'd like you to raise your hand, right? Don't say it out, don't uh, sort of spoil it for the others, but just raise your hand if you see the difference. It's not a subtle difference, right? There's a major difference between the two images. Are you all able to see it? Not the people who've already seen this in the rehearsal, right? Only the people who haven't seen this in the rehearsal, right? Wow, okay, two people so far, okay, that's, that's this, image, this demo worked better than I had anticipated, but if you look at the lower left corner of the screen, right, you see a stack of books there appearing and disappearing, that's not a small change, right, you're seeing the whole picture, but you're not able to observe and detect that change, right, lower left corner of the video, you see there's a stack of books that's appearing and disappearing, so that's how constrained your attentional system is, 
And this demonstration called change blindness, a very stark demonstration of these traits of attention, as it were. Right? So uh, there are many such demonstrations like this on the web. You can look them up. The study of these traits of attention is not new. Right? There are many uh, scientists, eminent scientists, including um, uh, von Helmholtz and uh, William James, who all studied attention from you know 1800s and so on. And William James said very presciently, and he said very uh, long ago, he said, attention is the taking possession by the mind of one of what seem several simultaneously possible objects or trains of thought. So he already uh, mentioned this idea that the brain, the mind likes to latch on to one thing, right? Just one out of many. And in the hundred years or so since James, we've learned a lot about how attention works in the brain. Unfortunately, due to the uh, duration of this talk, I won't be able to summarize all of it. But all I can say is that it's a network of distributed systems in the brain that allow you to pay attention, right? Some of those are highlighted in your uh, slides and colors. There's also one part of the brain, a critical part here shown in red, that's the midbrain, right? Midbrain is particularly interesting because it allows you to control your eye movement, it allows you to orient your eyes, to look as it were. And the attention system in the brain and the eye movement system are intricately linked. Because if I asked you suddenly to stop and pay attention to me, you're going to immediately orient your gaze towards me, right? If you're looking at your phone, you're going to look up and look at me. So these two systems are intricately linked, right? So I'd like to keep that in mind. And in today's talk, we'll be covering three interesting questions. How best to pay attention? Is attention hardwired in the brain? And can we train the brain to pay attention? Each of these things has something to do with the straits of attention. We'll cover them one by one. How best to pay attention, right? We'll start with that. Can we navigate the straits of attention in some way? Can we navigate them efficiently? Now, this particular question came to us through a very interesting uh, sort of series of events in Open Day, which is an event organized by the Indian Institute of Science, where the public from Bangalore comes in and we show them demos and so on in our labs. And we showed them, you know, the public, this change blindness demo, right? Many such images. We thought we would uh, surprise the people who came in, we would challenge them and so on. They're going to find this all very difficult. Indeed, most of them found this task difficult, right? Like many of you did, I saw a handful of hands going up, but many of you did find this challenging, right? But then the surprise was on us because there were some guys who nailed every single one of the change images that we showed them. And we were shocked, right? How were people so good at this task? At least some people so good at this task. Conversely, there were people who absolutely for the lives of them could not solve a single image, right? So this kind of spectrum of uh, performance in this task made us wonder what is going on? In one, what is the strategy that the people who are doing well are using to solve this task? So for this, rather than looking directly in the brain, we looked at eye movements as a proxy for attention. I already told you that the eye movement system and the attention system are linked. Uh, we can actually track eye movements in the lab using this fairly sophisticated apparatus. This allows you to track the pupil the, using sort of an IR camera. So wherever the eye is looking, your uh, sort of camera tracks their gaze in real time on a screen. And so we did this as our participants performed this change blindness task as they were solving this task. And we asked, is there any difference in the pattern of eye movements of people who do this task very well compared to those who really fail at this task, right? That's what we wanted to know. To cut a long story short, very simple eye movement patterns gave us the answer to success in this task. First, gaze duration. That is how long you look at a point in the image before you move on to the next, right? So both participants who were extremely lethargic, right, who had very long gaze durations at every point in the image before they moved on to the next, and participants were extremely impatient, right? So you look at one point and just, you know, keep scanning the image like that. Both of them were equally unsuccessful. Participants, on the other hand, who waited just the right amount of time before moving on to the next point in the image, who were sort of patient, were the ones who were most successful at this task. Similarly, participants who moved their eyes in a very haphazard fashion, right? They sort of erratically moved their eyes across the screen. They were also quite unsuccessful at this task. And it's, in fact, participants who are extremely methodical and scanned the image very methodically who are good at this task. So to conclude how best to pay attention, it turns out it's very simple. You are, should be patient and methodical. Sounds almost too trivial to be interesting. But surprisingly, many of our participants could not do this and therefore were not able to solve the 
uh, change blindness task well enough, right? So quite a surprising conclusion from this study. The second question, is attention hardwired in the brain? Is there some sort of brain basis for attention? <coughs> something hardwired, right? In something innate in the brain about attention. So the motivation for this question came about uh, because when I was a graduate student at Stanford, we looked at the case of some patients who had organic damage uh, to one part of the brain called the parietal cortex here, the temporoparietal junction, especially in the right hemisphere. Now these patients exhibit a very sort of strange type of phenotype, which is you put them in a room, so you have a whole bunch of, you know, uh, objects in front of them and you ask them to name the objects. They will name everything on one side of the room and completely ignore everything on the other side. It's a very strange phenotype. This is even stranger, you ask them to draw the face of a clock, they will draw all the numbers on one side and just ignore all the numbers on the other side. It's not like they don't know that clock numbers go up to 12, right, or whatever. They would simply just draw one half of the face, they're attentionally blind on one side. They're not visually impaired, they're just attentionally blind. It turns out that even normal, healthy, cognitively normal individuals like us have these kinds of attentional biases. We tend to focus too much to one side or another, and that's partly because the hemispheres of our brains are a little bit different, right? They, the two hemispheres of our brain do things a little bit differently, so we tend to have these attentional biases, even, you know, most of us here. And uh, we asked ourselves, is there any reason in the brain, can we look up, uh, find any structure or any kind of connection in the brain that will allow us to find some basis for these kinds of attentional biases or asymmetries. Now for this we used a technique called diffusion MRI, diffusion magnetic resonance imaging. It's a very sort of a new technique that allows you to measure the diffusion of water molecules in the brain and using certain kinds of algorithms called tractography algorithms, it allows you to trace where the axons, the fiber bundles, the wires connecting different brain structures how they are run, right? We're looking at the diffusion, the pattern of diffusion of water molecules. And based on this, we can construct very elaborate wiring diagrams of how different parts of the brain connect with each other, right? So this, what you see there are some pretty pictures that we get after running these tractography algorithms. So it tells you how different parts of the brain talk to each other. And for this particular study on asymmetries in attention, attention biases, we image the superior colliculus. We looked at how that area, the midbrain area that controls eye movements, how that connects asymmetrically or differentially with the two hemispheres of the brain. And it turned out surprisingly that the extent of asymmetry in the superior colliculus connections with the other parts of the brain could very well predict how biased an individual would be in terms of their attention. So if an individual was sort of more biased and more sort of focusing on one side, their superior colliculus connections to the rest of the brain would be much more asymmetric in that individual. Right. So is attention hardwired in the brain? Yes, at least some aspects of attention seem to be literally hardwired in the brain. Right. That's what we've discovered here. So finally, let me... Uh, uh, you know, address this question, can we train the brain to pay attention? Can we somehow narrow, uh, these narrow straits of attention, can we widen them a little bit, right? And the motivation for this, as you may know, is uh, disorders like ADHD are increasingly diagnosed in the population, attention deficit disorder in, in younger children as well as teens. Um, and the current available therapies for this are all Ritalin, Adderall, and so on, uh, you know, uh, these are all drugs, they're pharmaceuticals that long-term side effects of many of these pharmaceutical drugs are completely unknown, right? So we don't know much about what happens if you use them over a long period of time, but you have to because these disorders develop at a young age, right? So in our lab, we've developed a system, a brain-computer interface system that allows you to record brain activity. So what you're seeing there is the, a person looking at a, a, you know, sort of a dummy here, looking at a computer screen. And the brain activity from that person is recorded using a technique called scalp electroencephalography, or EEG. The EEG activity is processed by a computer and provided as neurofeedback back to that person in a manner that can allow them to control their own brain activity and ultimately perhaps help them improve attention. 
So I'll conclude with this movie. Now what you're about to see is a demonstration we did actually during open day. And the, that person whom you're seeing there sitting in front of the screen facing sort of, uh, you know, towards the one side of the monitor, that's the uh, volunteer, right, who has a scalp electrode uh, sort of on her head. And she's looking at a computer screen. As you can see, there's a little sort of computer screen monitor that she's looking at. And everything she's looking at, you can also see to your left, right? So that's exactly what she's looking at in real time, right? So now what does she have to do? What is her task? She has to move this white colored, so this video will repeat, so you'll see what I'm uh, talking about again. She has to move this white colored ball, which is called the catcher, left and right while catching as many of the falling yellow dots as possible, right? That's her task. As she moves it around, she'll get a higher and higher score, but she has to avoid these larger and brightly colored red and that purplish dot, right? Because if those hit the catcher, the game's over. Seems like a simple enough task, but the important thing here is she is not moving the catcher with keys on a keyboard or with a joystick. She's actually using her attention to move that tracker around left and right. And how is she doing that? she can attend either to the red light on the left or the green light on the right. You see two flickering lights there, right? The more she attends to the red light, the catcher will move to the left. The more she attends to the green light, the catcher will move to the right. How do we know to which light she's attending? Because the two lights are tagged with slightly different flicker frequencies. The more she attends to one, her brain signature changes, right? The EEG brain signature changes. We track that, we decode that in real time. And we give her control of the tracker depending on how well the decode was able to tell which light she's attending to. And if she really wants good control of the tracker, perhaps she'll be able to de develop some efficient strategies for differentially attending to the two lights, right? And the better control of the tracker she has, the better she's able to, we infer that the better she's able to differentially attend to the two lights. So you're hoping that by training an individual for long enough on games like this, We'll, they'll, we'll be able to come up with uh, ways to train their attention, perhaps in contexts that go beyond a simple game like this. So is attention trainable? So we're working on it. Perhaps keep watching this space. Hopefully we'll have some answers for you soon. And that's the, for the talk. Thank you for your attention.